My name is Rachel Johnson. I was born in North Carolina and raised in the beautiful green hills and forests of Virginia. And I studied history and philosophy here at BYU and then got a PhD in history at the University of Virginia. My primary research focus is on the intersection of the body and religious practice. For example, right now I'm working on a book that explores how changing conceptual models of the body in the early modern period affected religious practices. Uh, I focus on 18th century Spain and Latin America and a wave of Catholic reforms that were really shaped by this growing sense of separation or division and antagonism between the body and the mind, between spirit and matter, and it made certain practices really contentious, uh, like how to pray how to practice penitence, how to celebrate holy days. Um, for example, those who maintain a more integral, interdependent relationship between the body and soul were more likely to encourage art and music and dance and song and lighting and decoration and oratory and plays, even food, as really effective kind of sensory technologies and practices uh, to help individuals and collectives reach God. Whereas those who had a more uh, kind of dualistic or antagonistic understanding of the relationship between body and spirit would see those practices as either contaminating or distracting. And so I'm really intrigued by how understandings of the body shape uh, religious practice. That has also led me into um, some research in the 19th century about LDS ideas of embodiment. I am looking at how Protestant, Catholic, and secular thinkers responded to LDS ideas about an embodied God or the idea that human bodies are a necessary part of spiritual progression. Uh, I'm really intrigued by how some people found those to be radically disruptive and others found those ideas to be extremely culturally resonant with fears about religion being too abstract or disconnected from the social and economic realities of embodied life. Some conclusions I am coming to are one, that we are never disembodied. We might feel disembodied, especially in a digital age where we are um, really attuned to creating a kind of frictionless ease, but even that sense of disembodiedness has its own embodied effects. Um, we are always embodied. And when we really tap into the complex relationship between our emotions, our physical movements, our sensations, and our spiritual capacities. Um, one, I think we open up rich opportunities for spiritual engagement, but spiritual engagement itself expands from, you know, particular practices or places like prayer and church to really just life. Life itself becomes a spiritual practice as we figure out how to engage with, with suffering, how to respond to our passibility to being affected by each other. And so that to me has been really, um, really enriching. I think something else I've learned through the study of history and the study of religion is how culturally conditioned our understandings of the body are and how that can constrain or, or shape what we experience, what we interpret, what we pay attention to. So for example, in a culture where childbirth and aging and suffering and dying are more visible and seen as more collective concerns, those experiences are gonna have different meanings than in a culture where those experiences are less visible or institutionalized in certain ways. Um, you could say the same about cultural scripts around emotions, the way we understand the proper communication of or experience of anger or sorrow or joy, um, those are gonna have very different registers and different meanings based on, on how our culture uh, interprets those. So that study of history and religion has really made me more conscious of and curious about our, um, our cultural conditioning and, and how we can maybe use history to, to break open those scripts, to break open those constraints and, and have different concerns or different questions and, and different possibilities. So some things that the study of religion has introduced for me in my own, my own practice and my own faith um, are one, just how rich this conversation is. Uh, 
I am, because of history, able to engage in an ongoing conversation with so many questions and perspectives that I would never have on my own. It makes faith a very collective enterprise, and, and I love that. It's also given me really um, concrete learning experiences. For example, my study of female Christian mystics has made me attuned to how averse I am to suffering and emotional intensity, and it's made me curious about a whole host of experiences that I exclude from my spiritual metabolism because they waded in so directly to those experiences, and so it's really shaped the way I, I engage those experiences. Or my study of indigenous Catholics, for example, has made me really sensitive to our responsibility to each other as, as the body of Christ, as, as the human body, to the ways in which we communicate and co-create religious experience, especially across difference, and how powerful music and art and song can be in forging these um, collective synergistic religious experiences across difference. Um, and from Catholic reformers, I've become more sensitive to how potent those embodied practices can be, how deeply I affect and am affected by others and their emotional register, their bodily comportment for good or ill. And so it's made me more sensitive to uh, the kind of potency and the, um, the interpenetration of our, of our embodiment, of our um, experiences. And so I think it's given me um, a lot more uh, curiosity and sensitivity to those kind of concerns that I wouldn't have had otherwise. And my own study of our, of our faith tradition and our history has made me really uh, appreciative and, and inquisitive about the spiritual task of embodiment. I think our claims that embodiment is part of our spiritual progression and our divine destiny has really turned this into an amazing adventure that is worth paying attention to, and I love getting to do that.